Amen. Isn't this a wonderful time of the year? I love it. I love the enthusiasm. I love the, the sense that in some way or another throughout the whole world, Jesus Christ is being mentioned. Just some way or another, Jesus is being mentioned. Looking forward to the musical this weekend, right? This weekend, I get it all mixed up. I, I think we need to pray for our soloists. It seems like they all have ear infections. Every time you, they come up, they're... <laughs> you ever notice that? Yeah, some of them have hip problems, too. They're... <laughs> Larry seemed to have both. And we can pray for you if that's what you need. <laughs> Lord, heal those ears and that hip. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us praise him together this morning. Hallelujah. Now, I recognize that I'm not talking to shallow and superficial Christians this morning. If you've been in this church for any amount of time, you have gone deeper and fallen more deeply in love with Christ and have recognized that the Lord's blessings are renewed every day and that you will never plummet the depths of truth in Jesus Christ, never. So I'm going to take you on a little journey with me this morning. I've been burdened lately. I, I, I even mentioned it last Sunday at the 1030 service about praying God's word back to him. And God has confirmed that to me in two or three ways since that. I think that we have prayed lots of things that we want and think we need, but we don't know our own hearts and we don't really know our own needs. God does, and he heard us the first time we prayed. But I think if we want to get into the depths of this, into the true trenches of spiritual warfare, the only way to recognize real power is God's word. And praying back to God what he already said to us, my, it leaves heaven, it comes to earth and goes back to God. Everything is from him, to him, for him, by him, and back to him. See, So I ask you this morning, Lord Jesus, as we begin a journey that, that hears us crying out for deeper things in the spirit, as Paul said, that I may know him, that I may know him him it wasn't the church he wanted to know he wanted to know Jesus Jesus I want to know you Jesus not just in salvation which is done and eternal it's powerful but all oh, the depths of that salvation the layers upon layers of height and depth and width of the love of God. I want to know them. And so I ask today that you will guide me as you spoke to my heart yesterday and Friday, every day of the week. Lord, now help me to put those thoughts and words together that it might edify, build up, teach the body of Christ. And I ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. amen. And before you're seated, I'd like for you to read with me. Jeremiah uh, chapter 15, verse, let me find it. And uh, with, then we're going to read it together. 15 and verse 16. Ready? Your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, 
O Lord God of hosts. Jesus, thank you for being seated. Your words were found. It means they were lost. But somebody found them. Some hungry heart. Some human being, some individual that knew there was more to this physical world than just eating and drinking and sleeping and buying and selling and marrying and giving in marriage and aging. Some saint of God, some prophet of God was on a quest to find that which was true and real and eternal. And it was Jeremiah the prophet who said, your words were found And when I found them, I ate them. He didn't say I read them. I studied them. No, it's more pointed and forceful than that. He said they they are so precious that I ingested them did not contemplate them. They did not rest in my brain. I took them into my body. They are so precious and so necessary that I count them the same as food. I cannot live without your words. I ate them. It's pretty powerful. And your word was to me. Notice, words and word. Your words, plural, were found and I ate them. Your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Now, I have to ask questions this morning to all of us. Is God's word an obligation? Is it something you must do? Do you check it off? Do you wish it were shorter so you could read it less in a year to get through it? Is God's word something you have to work at, make yourself do, discipline yourself to to study and read? Your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. My joy comes from your word. Your word makes me rejoice. It makes me happy. I'm ecstatic. I shout it. I think on it. I breathe it. I Talk it. Other conversations bore me. They seem meaningless. I want to talk about him, his word. Every time I turn around, I want a verse to speak to me. I want to see God in every situation in life because they make me happy. They give me joy. They are not boredom. They are not difficult. They are the source of my life. I searched for your word. I found your words. And now they make me full of joy. I ate them. But you notice that before they became his joy and rejoicing, he did indeed eat them, all of them. That's not the first time that is mentioned in Scripture. 
in the 10th chapter of Revelation. There's an angel that comes down from heaven, a mighty angel. And he puts one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. And in his right hand, he's holding a little book that's open. And another angel said to John, go and take the little book from him. And John went up to the angel and said, give me the little book that is open. And he took it, and the other angel said, now eat it. Eat the book. Well, that book is our Bible. Eat it. He didn't say memorize it or study it. It's, he said, eat it. And he said, when you do, it will be sweet in your mouth but it will be bitter in your belly. John said, I ate the book, and boy, was it sweet in my mouth, but not long after, it was bitter inside of me. My belly was bitter. I laid over this passage of Scripture this week, and here's what the Holy Spirit said to me about that. Most Christians read the Bible for sweetness. They get it into their mouth and like chewing gum, they chew it for sweetness. And then when all of that is gone, they discard it. They like to talk it. They like for it to comfort them. But how many of my children will eat it? And let it go down so deeply in them that it makes them bitter in the belly. What does that mean? It means that instead of the word just making you happy for a little while, the word then becomes a medicine. And it goes down beyond thoughts and feelings and opinions. And it's not just something you check off and you don't just read it in 20 minutes. It goes down inside of you, and then it begins to show you who you are. And when you read Scripture and you find out who you are, like when James said, you fight among yourselves just because you want what you want. You, you ask and receive not because because you ask with the wrong motives that you may consume it upon your own lust. And it hurts and it's bitter when you realize that I could, I, I may not be getting an answer to prayer because I'm selfish. And it becomes embittering. I'm just going to ask you the best I know how this morning. Have you decided to eat the Word of God, not just taste it? Have you decided to let it go down inside until its truth makes you see yourself and you become bitter? You see, until the Bible is bitter in your belly, it cannot come out as joy and rejoicing. It doesn't stay bitter in your belly. It opens up your understanding and you begin to see who you are and what God wants from you and the forgiveness and the patience and the long-suffering of the Lord as he works in you. And when that bitterness gets you to the place that you realize, I can do nothing without Jesus and I am still driven by flesh. And you realize that the Holy Spirit then comes to heal you on the inside and that same word that made you bitter will make you joy and rejoice in its truth. To the degree that you fill your life with the word of God, that is the degree that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Did you hear me, church? To the degree that this becomes my joy and rejoicing, to the degree 
that I want this more than anything else, I will have that same amount of the Holy Spirit in my life. You can't be filled with the Holy Spirit and not be filled with the Word of God. Neither can you be filled with the Word of God and not be filled and driven by the Holy Spirit. I tell you, those young pastors that watch me every Sunday, if everything you do is not bathed in prayer and based on the Word, it is flesh. I don't care how fast you're growing, how much money's coming in. I don't care if you got on your third TV station. I don't care if you just finished your fourth book. If what you do is not based on the Word of God instead of your ambitions, if what you do is not bathed on in prayer and not because of prayer, you are operating in the flesh. And the flesh so many times looks like the Spirit and sounds like the Spirit, but it is not the Holy Spirit. And it will not last. You say, but... I, I, I just, re I, I, preach, I just open the Bible and preach it to my congregation because it's all anointed. Not so. Oh, yes, it's all anointed. But you see, the word, Jesus, speaks words to people. There are specific, designed, rhema, appointed words for a congregation at a certain time. No preacher of the gospel just waits to the last minute and opens up and just picks something out. No. You have to seek it, wait for it, cry about it, long for it, eat it. Eat it. Because although it's all the word, the word has words. Well, Jesus, the Word, had a word for Peter. Jesus, the Word, had a word for Paul. Jesus, the Holy Word, Revelation chapter 1, the mighty Son of God risen from the dead, the Word had a word for the seven churches in Asia. Because God speaks individually to every one of us from his word. And you cannot be a fruit-bearing, on fire, spirit-filled follower of Jesus Christ if this word is not abiding in you. Why? Because Jesus said, the words that I say unto you are spirit and life. Spirit and life. Far too many Christians want to go to church and shout. Now, a lot of, I found out a lot of people don't know what that means. If you come from a non-Pentecostal, you don't know what shout means. To you, that means yell. But to Pentecostals, it meant have some type of spiritual shaking and breaking, and you do scream at times. But there are far too many people who want to go to church and experience something, feel something, but they have not had the Word of God teach them anything that week. They've not eaten one meal from the Word of God. And I'm telling you, if you don't live this book, what you're doing is flesh. They that are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. Not church attendees. Not teachers, not even preachers, but only those who are led by the Spirit of God. These are the sons of God. You are not led by the Spirit of God because you have ministerial license or because you grew up in the church. You're led by the Spirit of God when the Word of God richly dwells in you. That was Paul's prayer. May the word of God dwell in you richly. Admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, not caring what the world thinks, not caring what half-backslid church members think. It's 
you and Jesus, filled with the Spirit, filled with the Word of God, eating the Scriptures, ingesting them till they do something painful yet fruitful way down deep inside of you. Here's how Hebrews chapter 4 says it. I'm going to take my time this morning, and when I leave this pulpit, I'm going to feel like I covered this the way God wanted me to. Hebrews 4 and 12. For the word of God is living. You know this, don't you? It lives. When, when it is spoken, life is spoken. When a spirit-filled man or woman of God speaks the word of God, they are speaking life. Word of God is living and powerful, active, and sharper than any two-edged sword. And notice what the Word of God does. That's why when the Word of God is preached, there's always friction in the congregation. You can preach a lot of stuff, and most people will just be happy and say, we went to church today. But when an anointed person who has had their belly filled with bitterness from seeking and eating truth begins to preach the word of God, there will be friction out there. There will be a, an uneasiness about people. There will be disagreement because that's what the word of God does. It, it shakes us from our normality and from our languid approach to the Holy One, and it begins to stir us, but notice what it does. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces. Pierces. Now, you don't need a sharp two-edged sword to pierce, but you do need one to cut and divide. You can pierce with a screwdriver, but only a sharp, two-edged sword, a scalpel of the Spirit can divide. And I want you to notice three pairings there. He talks about soul and spirit. Notice, joints and marrow, thoughts and intentions. So here's what he says. This living, powerful, active, sharp, Word of God pierces even to di the division, the dividing of soul and spirit. You see, this is the only thing in the world that lets you know the difference between soul and spirit, between joints and marrow, between thoughts and intentions. But what does that mean? Because without the Word of God, you see, your soul is what you feel. Lots of people think it's the Spirit of God moving when it's their soul, it's their flesh, it's their emotions. It's them. And they get it mixed up with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit doesn't need emotions. The Spirit doesn't rely on a feeling. The Spirit of God is deep and beyond imagination and comprehension. It's holy. It's eternal. It's forever. And it's different from the soul. That's why people stay confused all of the time about what they feel. I don't know if this is God. I don't know if this is me. I feel this, but is it me or is it God? I don't know. Is this the Holy Spirit telling me something? Or is this just me or is this... Other people influencing me. Folks, you cannot know unless the word of God richly abides in you. You've got to understand that the word of God teaches you how to separate your feelings from your faith. Separate your emotions from what really is the truth of the living God. That's why I've been amazed, you know. Several weeks ago, I mentioned uh, how awful, how ungodly Halloween is. And people contested that. They went on Facebook and all these other 
demonic avenues of communication and question that. How in the name of God Almighty can any believer actually question the evil of Halloween and indulge in it? It's because they don't read the Scriptures. If you don't read the Scriptures, you don't have the Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit, you don't know the difference between what you feel and what God said. I would like to ask somebody to say amen. Would you believe that there were people who contested what I said a couple of weeks ago about yoga? It's evil. It originated in Asian, Middle Eastern, Far, far Eastern mysticism. I get my geography mixed up. It's mysticism, sir. Ma'am, it's not just for your mental well-being so you can gather yourself and concentrate on the power within you. Oh, yeah. That's called trafficking with spirits. And it is evil. And you shouldn't be meditating on anything except the word of the living God. But if you don't know the word of the living God, if you have not eaten the word of the living God, you won't know the difference. And you'll talk one thing with your mouth, but you'll look like the world in everything else that you do. So the Holy Spirit, through the word of God, comes and he pierces and he divides and he makes clear the difference between flesh and spirit and, and joints and marrow. See, I've, I've got joints here. Of late, some of them have begun to ache. Joints. The joints connect everything. You see, I am connected. My structure, my skeleton is all together because of my joints. It's, my, it's, it's what I'm made up of. But the marrow in my bones, creates blood. Did you know blood is made in the marrow of your bones? And blood is life. My, think of it. That white, chalky stuff in the bone is what makes the blood that flows through you that creates life. And see, if you don't read the Bible and you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you won't know the difference between religious structure and habit. I'm just doing this to get it over with. And real life-giving Holy Ghost power. All over the city and around this world today, people will go into a structure and they will worship in a structure and a habit and a religion without the life and power of the Holy Spirit operating. They'll go through the motions. They'll do their Episcopal thing, their Catholic thing, their Methodist thing. And I'm sorry to say a lot of Spirit-filled churches are just about the same way they are dying on the vine because they've let structure and religion and peer pressure and the need for full pews and full bank accounts influence them away from the Word of God and into those things that appeal to the flesh. But see, if you know this book, if you read this book, if you eat these words, without hesitation, you can identify dead structure from living spirit. And that's why we must be people of the word. But then he goes on and says, this word of God pierces even to the dividing of thoughts and intents or intentions. And that's sometimes where it gets bitter in your belly because, oh God, how, how many thoughts will we have today? And even our best thoughts may not be God's thoughts. And we don't know, again, am I thinking good things? Is this from God? Is this from the Scriptures? Is this? No. 
when you know the Word of God, when the Word of God is feeding your soul, when you are a student of the Scripture, when you are a connoisseur of manna from heaven, you'll find out that your thoughts are not His thoughts. And your ways are not His ways. And then the more you read, the more you find out what your real intentions are. When you really get filled with the Spirit and the Word, you begin to detect, I'm doing this for me. I'm doing this because of me. I have a selfish motive. I have a desire that is not from God. It's all about me. But if you don't know the Scriptures, there will be infighting. If this, if this choir does not eat the Bible individually and pray, there will be all this competition about who's going to sing and who's in charge and who's the leader and who's blah, blah, blah. I get sick of that. When people don't read and pray, there's always this jockeying to say, I'm in charge, or that person's in charge, or these the, he, this is the best, and these are the ones. Don't get mad at me this morning. You people stand up in front of them. You plow the ground before I get up here. You ought to be full of the Word of God. You ought to come in here under the power of the Holy Spirit. You ought to be chock full and fat of the bread that comes down from heaven. And when you are, there won't be that competition among you. If this choir were full of preachers, I'd say the same thing. And I'm saying it to you as well. When we are not in that book, we think that selfishness is okay. That self-aggrandizement, that's okay. I'm talented, I'm capable, I've been here longer. You'll start saying, I move myself up rather than I lay myself down at the feet of Jesus. I'm just going to stick it in the eye this morning because I'm talking to young preachers watching me and you are full of yourself. You dream of the big one. You dream of the book becoming a bestseller, running in the circles with all the TV evangelists. You just want to be known. You're so full of flesh, and yet you stand up and purport to preach the Word of God. Oh, listen. If you are truly filled with spirit and word, if, if Dennis were to say to any one of you singers, Mm, I think it's time for you to move on. You will say, you know, I did what I could. If this is God's way of moving me somewhere else, it's not easy, but I accept what God has for my life. I don't know how this is going to fit in right here, but I heard a great preacher the other day a great preacher who's now with the Lord, say something to this effect. When I get to heaven and see him, look him in the face. My Lord, my Savior, my Redeemer, God's Son, the Lamb of God, when I get to heaven and look him in the face, I will only have two words to say to him. And I thought, oh God, what's this going to be? I did. I thought, oh, what are you going to say? And this person said, I will look at my Lord and Savior and bow my head and say, I tried. I made mistakes. I got in the flesh. I hurt people at times. Sometimes I thought I was right when I was wrong. And sometimes I knew I was wrong but pretended I was right. But I always came back, Lord. Because of your grace and mercy, I've come back again and again and again. And when I stand before him, he said, I will look at him and say, I tried. When you get full of the Holy Scripture, full, 
when it's running out of you. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, it's driving and empowering you. You recognize that you got nothing without Jesus. And, and whatever you do without Jesus is a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And it may move the emotions, but it will not move the one that sits on the throne. He knows our thoughts and our intentions. And here's what I am convinced of. I've read it. Isaiah, Jeremiah, here it is. Listen to this. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven does not return to the earth, that, that means when rain and snow fall, it does not go back up as rain and snow. It hits the ground. It becomes water. What does it do? It, it waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. He said, just as surely as the rain falls out of heaven and comes to the ground, it produces something. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It will not come back empty. It will not return to me without results, without fruit. When I speak it, when it goes out, it always produces something. It shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Did you see that? What, what is the thing for which he sent it? He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all of their destructions. Oh, church, listen to this preacher today. We don't realize that without the word, we destroy ourselves. Unless we are in the word, unless we are eating the book, unless the words are speaking to us, unless we are walking in the spirit, we create our own destructions. We're tearing down what God has built up. We're living in defeat and misery. Our life is dismal. We create our own destructions, but God's word was sent to heal us from sickness and sin and every opposing force. God's word was sent to deliver us from ourselves and give us victory and life in Jesus every day that we walk on this earth. Stand with me, please. I don't know that I felt this past week the way I just felt this moment when I said he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. When we don't pray, I'm telling you, we destroy ourselves. When we don't walk in the Spirit, we destroy ourselves. When we're not in the Spirit, we are in the flesh. When the Word of God does not richly abide in us, somebody else's Word does. Can you hear me this morning? Maholas. They're going to put Jeremiah back on the screen. And we are going to have a short prayer meeting. And we are going to pray these words back to God. I'm going to pray out loud, but I want you to pray as well. Pray this word back to God. Because God said his word would do something. Didn't he say it? It will make something happen. It will accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. There it is. There's your prayer right there. Pray it in your own way.
Go back to the first part, if you would. Church, listen to you, Pastor. To say I don't understand the Bible is to say God cannot teach me. To say I just don't have a mind for that. I don't mind singing. I don't mind witnessing. What are you going to witness about? What are you going to sing about? No, there's only one way. It is the Word of God. The Word of God defeats Satan every time. There are more Bibles in the world than any other literature that has ever existed. There are today more translations of the Word than have ever been in the history of man. On your phone, on your device, are more apps for the Bible than have ever been in the world's history. There is no excuse for any child of God not to be filled with the Word of God. No excuse. If, if you are deficient in the Word, it's because you chose to be. And if you chose to be, you are walking in the flesh. You are making bad decisions. Your prayers are not being answered. You're in bad shape. Because the Word of God is able to fill you, guide you, and make you wise unto God. I want to pray here. Lord Jesus, I read from your own mouth. I hear your own prophet saying your words were found. Lord, would you put a sense of hunger and desperation in us today that we will go searching, that you will teach us you have something to say to us every day, all day long? Will you deliver us from our laziness and our worldliness? And will you make something rise up inside of us that says, I must hear from God through his holy word and search it till we find it and know that when we find it, it was you that led us there. And if you led us there, you'll teach us what we need to know there. And I ate them. Oh, holy God, will you make us so desperate, not just to chew gum, but to have a meal and a medicine that goes down inside and stirs until we become bitter and dissatisfied with our well-being, our own personal state of mind. Oh, God, I pray it. I'm praying it from my heart. Let me eat the scriptures. Let me want them more than I want my own necessary food. Lord, it was your man Job who said, I desire the word of the Lord more than my necessary food. And your word was to me the joy. Lord, can you show us, give us a revelation today that joy does not come from bonuses and paychecks, from getting married and having babies and buying things and show us that real joy comes from knowing the Word of God inside of us that makes us rejoice that our sins are forgiven, our names are in the Lamb's book of life, our destiny is sealed and secure in Christ Jesus the Lord that we have need of nothing. We have no lack in our lives because of the Word of the Lord. And thank you, Jesus, that we can say, I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Hallelujah. Somebody else ought to praise him today. I am called by your name. I don't know how you interpret that I thought of it this way. I'm called by your name. When somebody says, Jesus, I start going in that direction. It's calling my name. Oh, Lord Almighty, I'm going in that direction. 
because I'm called by His name. Not only am I called out of darkness into His marvelous light, but my title is Son of God. Hallelujah, my name is child of God. Would you, would you raise your hands with me and would you praise the Lord this morning and would you put a seal on what you've heard today? I know probably time to sing, David, but I, there's something else I want to say. Because I'm a preacher and I'm a pastor and I, can, I just don't throw stuff out. There is no reason in the world why you should be confused between right and wrong if you are full of the Word of God. Let me say it again. There is no reason why any of you or you should be confused about what is right or wrong if you are filled with the Word of God, the truth of God, the knowledge of God, the clarity of God, the Spirit of God, the teacher from heaven. If you're confused, it's a delinquent prayer life a shortage of the Word of God. And it can be solved by getting on your knees and opening this book in front of you. We just prayed the Word. You see that? We prayed that. I believe with all my heart it went back to heaven. And then God's going to send answers. God's going mm, to send hunger. God's going to send desperation into our souls. I tell you, brothers, I don't know when Jesus is coming, but I want to be drunk on him till he gets back to get me. Say amen, somebody. Okay, David, let's sing it. Show me your way. Amen. You may ha already have your own reading schedule, but I'd like for those who are coming back tomorrow night for prayer to read the book of James, five chapters, book of James tomorrow night before you come back. Is that okay? Okay. Book of James. When we come tomorrow night, we're going to be praying Scripture. It may not be from James, but we're going to pray God's Word back to God. And I'm expecting God to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Blessings on you, church.